Hello again. Here we are uh, still talking about center of gravity. This is the third video in a four video series. Uh, the focus of the series is the relationship between the center of gravity of the load and the rigging and lifting of that load. Knowing that center of gravity and rigging to the center of gravity is very important. In this video, we're specifically going to look at how we can find the center of gravity for a complex load that has an uneven weight distribution. And I call this a system load, which I'll talk more about on the next slide. Uh, and why don't we just go ahead and jump to the next slide and talk more about what I mean by a system load. It's a complex load with an uneven weight distribution. There are multiple zones with each of those zones or components. You, instead of zones, you could use the term component. But each of those zones or components have different weight densities and their own centers of gravity. Each component, there could be 10 components, there could be 10 different parts of our load with each load having its own specific, its own unique center of mass, center of gravity. Uh, this is really a common situation, maybe more common than anything else we've talked about in the video series. And over to the right there is an example, which I'll talk about here in a second specifically to, to further uh, highlight what I'm talking about here. But commercial AC systems, condensing units, air handling units, uh, chiller units, which we have in the picture to the right, a chiller unit. These loads are lifted. They're set on top of buildings. They're set adjacent to buildings. Um, they, they can be extremely heavy and they are complex from a center of gravity standpoint because there are all these multiple components. We have a tank here, we have plumbing here, we have, we have a fan system. I'm not an AC expert, so I don't really know how all this works, but I can look at this and see that I, I can't just look at this load and guess or estimate accurately the center of gravity of this load because of all of these different components. It's all within a nice rectangular footprint, but the weight distribution within this rectangular footprint is not evenly distributed. So I can't, I'm not gonna have much luck with the trial and error method. I'm not gonna have much luck guessing uh, accurately the uh, center of gravity for this system load. Again, this is what I call a system load. This is a good example of a system load. So let's, let's go ahead and talk more about the method that we use to find uh, the center of gravity for a load like this. This one is relatively simple, this problem that I'm working on. Uh, the diagram below represents a system load, let's say an AC condensing unit. Four distinct components with each component having its own center of mass. A term that you'll find uh, associated with this type of problem is also point mass, center of mass, point mass. There are four components, there are four point masses each represented by these red dots. Then we have the mass for each of these components or the weight for each of these components. For our purposes, let's use mass and weight interchangeably. The light, there's, each of these weights are labeled for each of these components. We have three relatively lightweight components and then we have one real heavy component sitting in the corner. And I did this intentionally we can already guess that our center of gravity is going to be over in here somewhere because this is where a large portion of the system's weight is located. We can already guess that. Yeah. And as we do the calculations and work through the process, we'll see uh, that that actually happened precisely where the center of mass is for this, uh, this type of system that we're looking at. Now, if we're using this method in the real world, before we can use this method, we have to have the information. We have to have uh, the mass of these different components. We'd go in and break down our, our load into different components. Then we would determine the mass for each of those components. Then we would determine the point mass for each of those components. Once we have uh, that information, then we can place it in a diagram like I have here. And once we have this diagram, to find our system center of gravity, we can superimpose this diagram on an XY coordinate plane. And here we go. Here's that diagram from the previous slide superimposed on an XY coordinate plane. After we have superimposed it, then we identify the coordinate for each of the point masses. 
uh, we identify the coordinate for this point mass, this point mass, and that's what the numbers are in the parentheses, are the coordinates, the xy coordinates for these different point masses. And believe it or not, this is all we need to find the center of gravity for this system load. It's all we need uh, using these formulas. And here's our formula that we need. Um, in this formula, x, y, these are the coordinates for the system's center of mass. This is what we're finding. And to find the coordinates for the system's center of mass, we're going to use m sub y, which is the moment around the y-axis. Uh, we're going to use m sub x, which is the moment around the x-axis. And then we're going to use the total system mass. And when we get into the problem on the next slide, uh, this little m, that's going to be the same number. That's the total mass for the system. Again, the sum of component masses, the total system mass. And the math is real easy. Once we get to this point, we get everything laid out. It's, there's, there's nothing really high level as far as the mathematical operations we're going to be doing. Uh, now, one thing I want to mention, and I don't want to get into it and blow you away talking about uh, moment, uh, the concept of moment. But this is all based upon the concept of moment, which is the measure of force causing an object to rotate around an axis. Uh, around an axis or around a point, around a fulcrum, those three terms can be used interchangeably. Mathematically, it's the product of the um, object's mass and the, ax and the distance from the axis of rotation. That should say distance there. It's the product of the rotating object's mass and the distance between the mass and the axis of rotation. Actually, I do have distance in there. Um, mathematically, this is how you'll see it expressed. You'll see different, uh, different uh, people using different formulas. Uh, the one I like is big M moment equals force times distance. Uh, the, the nomenclature used within this formula has a big M moment equals little m mass uh, by little x distance. x is distance and the m is the mass. All right, well, let's jump into it. Let's do this simple, these simple calculations and find out where our center of gravity is for this system. Okay, here's our formula. And we need to first find the moment around the y-axis. And here's our formula for the moment around the y-axis. It's the sum of all the moments for these different components. The moments for the different components didn't mean to rhyme. It, uh, it's just nice that it worked out that way. But uh, let's go ahead and start plugging in our numbers. The, the mass for component 1 is 315. The distance from the x-axis, and, and I don't want to go into this, I don't want to be confused by this, but to find the moment around y, we're using the distance from the x-axis. If you would like more discussion of that, more explanation of that, I can do another video, you can come by the office. For our purposes, we don't need to get caught up chasing rabbits and, and dealing with that particular issue right now. Uh, but unless, if you're interested, let me know. But uh, again, the mass for component one is 315. It could be kilograms, could be pounds, uh, whatever. I'm not going to get caught up in the units of measure here. It's just, just the numbers, all we're interested in. Uh, mass is 315. The distance from the x-axis is negative 6. Again, the x-axis, negative 6. That's the, the x position for this particular point mass. Then we move on to the second component. The mass, 570. The distance from the x-axis, negative 7. The third component, mass, 658. The distance from the x-axis, 5. Then for our last component, mass, 3123. Distance from the x-axis, 6. Now we just need to do some multiplication and some addition, and we will have the moment around y figure that we need to put into this formula over here. And let me go ahead and bring up my calculator so we can 
take a look at this make sure I did my math correctly when I was putting the PowerPoint together we have 315 multiplied by negative 6 1890 and 315 by negative 6 1890 now we want to do 570 multiplied by negative 7 3990 negative 3990 both of these are negatives negative 3990 now for component 3 we want to multiply 658 times positive 5 3290 again 658 multiplied by 5 3290 then our last component, our last zone, thirty one twenty three multiplied by six, eighteen thousand seven hundred and thirty eight, eighteen thousand seven hundred and thirty eight. Now we just need to add those up. And we will have our moment around y. A negative 1890 plus 16,148 is our moment around Y. And I know it's like, uh, it's, it's kind of a slow process watching me click things into the calculator, but I think it's important to show you the, the calculator keystrokes I'm using to get these numbers. Even though it's simple, I think that's an important step in the process, showing you how I'm using the calculator. And I'm not using the memory functions on the calculator which I could be, but I purposefully don't use the memory function to show it to you every step, uh, uh, step by excruciating step. And I want to break it down as, as much as possible so you see what's going on. But we have m sub y, or the moment around y, we can go ahead and plug that into our formula over here. Now we find the moment around x. To find the moment around x, we're going to use the distance from the y-axis. And again, not going to go into y, uh, if you have questions, let me know. But we are using the distance from the y-axis to calculate the moment around x. For component 1, the mass is the same. Uh, 315 is our mass, just like it was in the uh, moment around y. It's, masses are going to be the same. Now we need the distance from the y-axis, positive 4. For component 2, mass 570, distance from the y-axis, negative 3. For component 3, 658, distance from the y-axis, 3. And for the last component, 3123 is our mass, and distance from the y-axis is negative 4. Let's go ahead and check my math just to make sure we have, I don't want that calculator, I want this calculator. All right, we have 315 times 4. Twelve sixty. Twelve sixty. Now we want to do 570 multiplied by negative 3 negative 1710 
and then we want to do 658 multiplied by 3 1974 Now we have 3123 multiplied by negative 4. Negative 12, 492. Again, 3123 multiplied by negative 4, uh, negative 12, 492. So now let's add all those up. Now one thing to keep in mind when you're taking certification exams, you can use the TI-30 calculator, but make sure you're, you're entering the correct keystrokes and uh, slow down a little bit. You'll, you'll have plenty of time, even though it's a, it's, a, it's a long exam, a lot of questions, but you'll have plenty of time on the BCSP certification exams. But make sure you don't make mistakes like I make and enter the wrong key uh, uh, periodically. Then our last, one here, our last component, negative 12, uh, 490, oops, see, I just entered the wrong key. Enter. Negative 10,968 is our moment around X, which goes over here in our formula. Now we have the moment around Y, we have the moment around X. Last thing we need to do is calculate the system mass, which is uh, also easy. Uh, we just add up the masses of all the components and when we do that we end up with 4,666. Check my math here. Yep, 4,666, and I did not intend for this to be uh, 666, just the way it worked out. If you're superstitious, I apologize. I'm not, it's just a number. So, uh, coming from my, my worldview at least. So, um, but now we have that mass, we plug that into our formula, and all we have left is a division to find our XY coordinates. We're gonna divide 16,148, uh, by 4666, let's go ahead and do that. We come up with 3.46, our x-coordinate is 3.46. Go ahead and bring this up here, 3.46. Now let's do find the y coordinate. Negative 10,968 divided by 4,666. And our y coordinate is negative 2.35. All right, and now we take these coordinates and we plot them on our on our on our graph. Again, 3.46, that's the x, go over to 3.46, then the y, negative 2.35. Uh, we come down, and there is the location for this system's center of gravity. Like I said previously, I set it up so that it would be uh, you know, we, we were able to guess pretty closely where it was at based upon the weight of this fourth component. 
I, I did it that way so when we did our calculation we would see how yeah that's 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 right that's where it needs to be um, now here is uh, this system center of mass on a larger image so you can see it a little bit better relative to the other component centers of gravity now when it comes time to rigging we want ideally our rigging to be configured so the hook will be directly over the center of gravity if our hooks directly over that center of gravity the load is going to be balanced it's going to be level we're not going to have any unintentional movements because we're not over the systems or the object center of gravity. If we do, uh, when we're rigging this to achieve level, to get our hook over, the, uh, over that center of gravity for the object, we could use a simple four-way sling with adjustable legs. Uh, the legs can be adjusted with adjusters built into the rigging leg or you could use turnbuckles, or you could also use come-alongs rated for overhead lifting. Uh, each of those come-alongs is going to be adjustable. You use four come-alongs. Uh, the come-along, it's important for me to stress, the come-along that we're using has to be rated for overhead lifting. You can't go to Atwoods or Lowe's and get one of their come-alongs and use it for overhead lifting. You have to go to Bishop Lifting or Industrial Splicing and uh, get the right uh, e equipment for, for this type of operation. And here is a picture of what we might be looking at. We have the center of gravity in this diagram over to the right. The, the collector ring where the hook will attach is directly over the center of gravity like it should be. And they're using multiple slings along with turnbuckles to adjust the legs the way those legs need to be adjusted to keep the hook over the center of gravity. Uh, now, one thing I need to mention, depending on the type of load that you're lifting, uh, the simple four-way sling may not be adequate. You may need a more elaborate design using spreader bars or lifting platforms or other devices. And, and that has to do really with the nature of your load that you're lifting. Uh, some loads with this type of rigging could be damaged when they are lifted. Uh, this rigging design could crush due to compression forces and or pull apart due to tension forces some loads. And I have it illustrated here on the, uh, on the diagram. You know, compression at the top crushes everything in, tension on the bottom pulls everything out. And when you're lifting with this type of rigging design with these pick points, you're going to have both forces that work simultaneously. And depending on how sturdy your load is, how well built your load is, you could crush it or you might pull it apart at the bottom. So that has to be taken into consideration when you, you are deciding which rigging system is going to be best for the load that you're lifting. All right, well, I hope that helps when it comes to identifying the center of gravity for complex loads, uh, system loads. Um, if not, give me a call. Um, be happy to help. Send me an email. Shoot me a text. I'm available, especially if you're an NSU student. That's what I'm here for. That's what they pay me for. Uh, just a quick summary of this video. We've looked at a method for identifying a single center of gravity uh, of a more complex load that's comprised of multiple components and multiple centers of gravity. Uh, final reminder, rigging the load to its center of gravity is an important aspect of rigging design. That, that needs to be our, on our list of priorities anytime that we're uh, lifting a load overhead. Um, I've mentioned this in the other videos. Rigging to the center of gravity is the best practice. That's what we should strive to, to achieve with our rigging. But there might be those situations where we're not able to or it, we can't, for other reasons, rig to the center of gravity. It's not always absolutely essential. But if you're not rigging to the center of gravity, if you're purposefully not rigging to the center of gravity, that has to be considered also when you're putting together your rigging plan. 
All right, I'm all done. This is video three. There's one more video coming. It will talk more about the relationship between center of gravity and sling loading.